you may have heard the expression constitutional convention and know that conventions are an important source of constitutional doctrine in the United Kingdom. In this video, we will be asking what are constitutional conventions? What role do they play in our constitution? And why do constitutional actors comply with rules that do not have the force of law? And in a follow-up video, I will examine the proposal that is sometimes put forward that we should codify the conventions of the Constitution into law. Before we begin, let's dispel some terminological confusion. The term constitutional convention is sometimes used to describe a gathering for the purpose of drafting a constitution. And the word convention is sometimes used to mean an international treaty, as in the European Convention on Human Rights. But I'm not talking about either of these things here. The term as it is used here was popularised by 19th century constitutional scholar Albert Venn Dicey, who distinguished between the one set of rules which are in the strictest sense laws and the other set of rules which consist of conventions, understandings, habits or practices which, though they may regulate the conduct of the several members of the sovereign power, of the ministry or of other officials, are in reality not laws at all, since they are not enforced by the courts. So conventions were not laws according to Dicey because they were not enforced by the courts. Rather, they were, as he put it, the constitutional morality of modern England. The distinction between constitutional law and constitutional morality was a fundamental one for Dicey. By contrast, the distinction that was sometimes made between the written laws and the unwritten constitution was for Dicey a false opposition. And I think he was on this matter correct. You probably already know that much of the common law is unwritten in the sense that there is no authoritative written source for it, but it is law nonetheless. And nowadays, much of constitutional convention has been written down, for example, in the cabinet manual, whose status is best described as a non-authoritative code. For me, it is no surprise that it was dicey whose introduction to the study of the law of the constitution was published in 1885, who was the first to insist on this separation between law and convention. Before the 19th century, the prevailing view was that there was no such clear distinction between law and morality. Dicey's scholarship was connected to a broader movement that aimed towards the conceptual distinction between law and morality. And so the separation of constitutional law from constitutional morality was part of the intellectual programme of that movement. And nowadays, the idea that conventions are not enforced by the courts needs to be qualified a little. But I will not get into that here. At this point, an example of a constitutional convention might be helpful. One that is often discussed concerns the appointment of a prime minister. Now, as a matter of law, this decision belongs to Her Majesty the Queen. It forms part of what is called the royal prerogative, which you will hear more about later. Now, many of our constitutional conventions modify or constrain the operation of the royal prerogative. And that is part of the story of how the United Kingdom has made the transition from a monarchy to a democracy without the creation of a completely new constitution. This one is no different. The convention is that Her Majesty will appoint as Prime Minister the person best placed to command a majority of the House of Commons. Normally this will be the leader of the largest political party. Now it may be that Her Majesty has a strong personal animosity towards that particular leader or that she would prefer a different party if she thought that its policies might better suit the country. But she has to put these considerations to one side by convention, and in appointing a prime minister, she must exercise only her judgment and not her will. 
Now, there are a number of questions we can ask about this convention. One of which is why, other than as a result of her conscience, would Her Majesty follow that convention? Since there is no legal power to compel her to do so, as, as we saw, the rule is just part of constitutional morality and not law, to use Dicey's distinction. Now, one answer, and this would seem to be the decisive one in this case, has nothing at all to do with morality. It is a matter of prudence or good judgment. If Her Majesty were to choose someone who was not best placed to command a majority in the Commons, her government would most likely play soon find itself in considerable difficulties. Much of the business of government is transacted in Parliament, including passing legislation, including the Finance Act, without which the government would pretty quickly run out of money. There are policies to be publicised to the nation, and, and so on. If the person who was best placed to command majority support in Parliament were not chosen and someone else appointed in their place, then most of these measures that form government business in the Commons would not pass. The government would be in office, but not in power and it would likely be defeated on a motion of no confidence. The consequence of losing such a vote used to be a matter of constitutional convention too. The convention was that on losing a vote of confidence, the government would tender its resignation. But since 2011, this matter has been regulated by law, specifically by section two, subsection three of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. As an aside, the current government is committed by its 2019 election manifesto to get rid of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, which it says has led to paralysis at a time the country needed decisive action. This brings me to another point, the extensive reliance on constitutional convention in our constitution is supposed to be one of its benefits because it leads to flexibility and adaptability when change is needed. But let's get back to the convention that Her Majesty chooses as Prime Minister the individual best place to command a Commons majority. We could say that the convention is in most cases self-enforcing in the sense that it is in the interest of the person to whom it applies, Her Majesty, to abide by the convention. Many conventions are like this, although not all are by any means. So we need to think of some other reasons why constitutional actors like the Prime Minister would comply not only with the law, but with convention. It is certainly desirable from our point of view that they should do so. They facilitate the smooth running of government, including the transfer of power between governments following a general election. They have enabled the transition from a monarchy, not just a constitutional monarchy, but one in which the king or queen was actual ruler, to one that preserves its original legal form, but which in substance is democratic. And they supply a body of doctrine that regulates relations between constitutional actors, for example, between the executive and parliament. Political scientists sometimes talk about the importance of informal institutions to political processes. Helmke and Levitsky, for example, use this term to denote the socially shared rules, usually unwritten, that are created, communicated and enforced outside of officially sanctioned channels. So we, so we might think of conventions as including informal or perhaps semi-formal rules that political actors expect each other and, if they are honest, accept that they themselves should follow. This brings me to an important insight on the British Constitution, which comes from a former Lord Chancellor, Lord Simon. There are two Lord Simons in public law, so I have to make it clear that I am talking about John Allsbrook Simon. He said, our parliamentary system will work as long as responsible people in different parties accept the view that it is better that the other side should win than that the constitution should be broken. Now, there is a lot in that short sentence. One part of it is that constitutional actors have good reasons to act within the spirit of the Constitution, 
its morality as well as its laws. Because although there might be a short-term tactical advantage to acting contrary to the rules of constitutional morality, to do so would risk undermining the constitution itself. Responsible people in different parties, as Lord Simon says, can see that it is in everyone's long-term interest to abide by the rules, even if that leads to electoral losses or a defeat on a piece of legislation, because of the fear of the alternative, which is that if no one abides by the rules, the constitutional system itself would be undermined. But there is a darker side to Lord Simon's remark. That is, that the occasion might arise when the major players in politics think that winning is everything and that it is better to risk breaking the constitution than to lose. And so this brings us to Brexit. Now, Brexit, not just the referendum itself, but all the decisions that followed in relation to the withdrawal agreement and decisions yet to be taken on our future trading arrangements with the EU, have had huge consequences for the UK for its politics and for the fate of different political parties. And so it is not surprising to me that Brexit has stress tested our constitution almost to destruction, because this is precisely the sort of high stakes decision over the future direction of our country that might lead political actors to conclude that it is better to risk breaking the constitution because losing isn't an option. This leads politicians on all sides of that particular issue to face the temptation to engage in what Professor Nick Barber of Oxford University, following US constitutional lawyer Mark Tushnet, calls constitutional hardball. As Professor Barber describes it, constitutional hardball is played when political actors decides the stakes are so high that any lawful action is justified no matter how constitutionally problematic. Hardball stays within the confines of the law but runs against the spirit and sometimes the conventions of the constitution. Note how constitutional hardball, as Professor Barber describes it, is a distinctly modern phenomenon. It depends on just the distinction between law, which is enforced by the courts, and convention, which is not, on which Dicey insisted. And note that while you may wish to apportion blame, as the pundits have often done, as the process of Brexit has unfolded, constitutional hardball is a game which is played by many players. In the last parliament, the Prime Minister, the previous Speaker of the House, John Berko, and the Supreme Court have all been accused of playing hardball. It is easier to find fault, of course, with those whose views are opposed to ours. The tendency for the convention to be ignored or disregarded when political actors deem it appropriate to do so might be seen as one of the downsides of our flexible constitution. But remember, other areas of law also depend on a mixture of enforceable legal measures and non-authoritative guidance. Health and safety law is an example. So to finish on a slightly more positive note, Leo Amory was a conservative politician in the first half of the 20th century, whose thoughts on the British constitution is amongst the most incisive writing on the constitution. Amory described the constitution as not so much flexible as elastic. What that metaphor captures is the tendency of constitutional norms to reassert themselves and for the constitution to return to type when the occasion allows just as an elastic will snap back to its original length when the forces acting on it are released. I expect that the conventions of the constitution will pro prove elastic in that sense. When the political stresses of Brexit are dealt with, when the current high stakes game is played out, the demands that political actors respect the informal norms of constitutional morality will make themselves heard. In conclusion, the prominence of constitutional conventions in our constitution means that the informal or semi-formal rules which normally govern the conduct of politics and government can exceptionally be disregarded. This is part of the flexibility of our constitution, but it also comes at a cost because conventions are part of what makes government run smoothly. 
In the next video, I will be talking about some of the issues that would arise if we decided that the cost of this flexibility were too high and decided to place our constitution on a firmer footing. So far, we have only discussed one constitutional convention in detail. There are many others. As a follow-up to this mini lecture, can you find some other examples? A good starting place is the Cabinet Manual, which, as it says on the front, is a guide to laws, conventions and rules on the operation of government. And if you have any questions about the topic, use the discussion boards. Finally, look out for the follow-up lecture on should constitutional conventions be codified.